Welcome to our porch. This is our porch. It's usually my porch, but we're not usually surrounded by flowers when we're out here having a cocktail. We're having a cocktail. We, I've never interviewed my husband before, so this will be a first. How are you? I'm nervous. <laughs> I don't do interviews. I know you don't do interviews. Thank you for um, doing this one with me. I appreciate it. Great. Be nice. I'm doing the same question to everybody, so I'm not giving you any special treatment, okay? Okay. I never give them special treatment. Um, okay. So, how are you? You're good? How's, how's COVID treating you? got a beard? Mm-hmm. As much as I can grow the beard. I've never in 30 years of knowing you ever seen you with a beard. This is also a first. We both okay. are showing our gray. You look great. Great, by the way. Um, my first question for you, Mr. DeVita, mm -hmm. is um, what is your very first memory of APT? My very first memory of APT is watching Stephen Hemmings do Falstaff in Henry Ford Park One. I came out here to do the show, and I remember I, I knew Stephen, and I could only get a seat in the front row, which is really embarrassing for actors to have other action friends come out to see them. And uh, Stephen had uh, completely transformed himself with makeup. Why do you know that? Put it on a way. Got, no, he used the best. <laughs> I'm <thing>. joking. <laughs> so, Stephen was a rare. And uh, yeah, he was an amazing actor. That's my first, my first real vivid memory was that. I came up for, to see that and Tartuffe. I saw Randy Kim do Tartuffe. What year was that? I don't even know. It was before I worked here. So I auditioned a couple of times and did not get in here under the last um, artistic management. <laughs> um, but I still like the place. While you were in school in Milwaukee? Yeah, in the first year out of school. So you came out here, auditioned, and then saw so the show? Yeah, it's late 80s. Before you met me? Yeah. Yeah. That's a what do you think of the place? Well, it was gorgeous. I mean, yeah. Well, and I, I had seen uh, APT, they used to tour, and they toured uh, UW, UWM where I was going to school, so that's where I saw Randy do Hamlet. That's where I first saw Lee Ernst on stage. Uh huh. And um, in the Pabst Theater, they did Hamlet. Well, and uh, then they took actually to our school that they brought the, um, the Chekhovs. Um, so yeah, I watched them as a kid growing up in school. That's cool. Yeah. Long time ago. Um, when did you know that you wanted to be here? Well, after my first season, I got hired out here in 1995 to do the show. Right. Ken Albert brought me out um, to do Roman and Juliet with my friend Katie Davis, who had always joked that we would want to do that someday because we're about the same size and we're both little Italian kids and we said we should do that show someday. And, uh, her husband, Ken, who was the director, uh, asked me to come out and that was my first season out here. And then uh, I kind of fell in love with the place, both the theater and the land around here because I like to be outside and fish at the river and beautiful land. And Is there any moment you remember, like anything specific? That made you say, this place feels like home? No, I can't say there wasn't really a moment. I was just here and working. And first year I fished a lot and worked a lot at the same time. I was this is where we had kids. Both. Yeah, one year before we had kids. <laughs> and then all things changed. Yeah, I keep forgetting you're part of this. But, yeah. but what? That I'm the artistic director? Or you're asking. <laughs> no, I'm like saying, forget it. <laughs> no, please, go ahead. I mean, I remember you saying, after you came home doing Romeo, I remember you saying that you had never performed in front in front of an audience like this. Yeah, well, the audience was, yeah, quite amazing. You know, the kind of listening that they granted us, you know, the kind of energy that they brought to the audience. But, uh, it's very distinct. Uh, performed on all over the country, and Europe, too, in places. It was a really distinct energy from this audience. A positive yeah, it was interesting because I we had planned to be here for a year. Um, one yeah. summer, I was yeah. going to be here for a summer with you, uh -huh. and then you came home and said, "I don't know if I want to perform for another audience after yeah. this." Yeah, but we didn't know we had jobs. Then. We, we, right, we were just job in for one show and uh, one and year, one season. Yeah. What else did you do that first season? I did Flewellen and Henry V and um, Marlowe. Oh, States. right. Right, she suits. That's good. Yeah, it was a big season. It was fun. It was a fun season. Um, our friend John Langs 
Um, he describes working here for the first time when I asked him to come back. He described working here the first time like walking through fire a little bit, mm -hmm. like like burning off, walking through fire. I, was, I remember that distinctly, and I I wanted to know what you think he meant by that. Why do you think he said that? I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's the, the, in addition to the normal hardships of performing Shakespeare and, you know, the technical aspects of it and the size of the room. He's speaking as a, from a director's point, but from an actor. It's then, and at that time, we had no infrastructure here. We had no indoor rehearsal spaces. We had no air conditioning. So on, on top of doing, and we we're all doing at least sometimes three lead roles at that time. We didn't have the company that we had. So we got at least two lead roles, one year I had three. So both the side, the amount of work that you're doing, and then add you, we're rehearsing outdoors all the time. Right. In the heat, in 95 degrees on the stage, rehearsing eight hours a day. Um, so the sheer physical, um, uh, uh, physicality that it took to do that. We were young too, we were not a lot stronger. It's gotten harder over 27 years. And of course, we have air conditioning now when we have uh, indoor plumbing. And, yeah, I remember when we yeah. first got the air conditioning, you thought that might be a problem. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's like we can kind of, uh, you, need, you, know, you need air conditioning, you need a room to rehearse. Because we used to rehearse, you know, in the picnic shelter, which was, uh, I remember the sound of leaves. Um, trying to hear your partner speaking with us. We were moving around doing our blocking in the leaves and the dirt. Um, and then it was a joy to be in the veranda because it had <laughs> screens on it. It was terrible to be in the veranda. No, but back then compared to the picnic shelter, sure. that was really picnic good. Picnic shelter was in the, terrible. In the veranda. Um, so yeah, just, you know, just the, the amount of, of work, the amount of shows and words and rehearsing and the lack of infrastructure at that time was pretty daunting. But also, it was kind of like a challenge to you're young and hungry, and we're like, yeah, I can do this. So, um, so it was hard, but exciting. Right. You know, still is in that vein, although we had air conditioning. Hmm. I mean, I think John may have been talking a little bit about, I, I interpret it a little bit about um, the kind of people you meet in the room, the kind of actor you meet, the kind of, uh, uh, of, um, expertise you meet in the room. Well, yeah, the bar is really high. Well, and he was pretty young, right? Yeah, he was. He was he got you know, you're, you're working with so many people at the top of their craft, so um, uh, yeah, it's exciting and scary and intimidating and thrilling all at the same time. So, uh, but yeah, the bar is really high. It's set high and, and, uh, and we kind of reveled in that, though. You know? And beat ourselves up a lot. <laughs> you don't do that anymore. <laughs> that never ever happens now that you're older. That's okay. The best actors that I know always doubt if they're good enough. Never think they are. I, mean, I find them to be the strongest actors. But what do you who 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 do you think? Oh yeah, I won't say names. I just say all the actors that I respect always wonder whether they're good enough. If they did they did they do their best that night? They tried their best. And, and you just need a balance of not beating yourself up about it. Because you know, that can be debilitating as well. Yeah, it's like an athlete. I think it's the same as an athlete. You, know, you always assess your game afterwards. You know, and then the things you miss to train harder at. Yeah, you used to call it, uh, there's a story, whether it's true or not, that when you were doing Hamlet, I think it may not be true, but like you had a, an exit and you had to go back around and Dee Dee was back there. And you would give them a percentage of how well it was going or something every once in a while. But you have a percentage game, you call it. No, I don't actually use numbers. I just I tell younger actors and myself that it's not about getting it perfect because that's, in my opinion, that's not humanly possible. That if you were to do this art form perfectly, I always joke that you'd disappear in a spot of ash. You, you would have made it in the holy grail. <laughs> and there'd be a little oil spot. They'd say, yeah, Jimmy did it. <laughs> So, but I know that's not possible, but you still strive for it, so. And for people, what do you mean by that? I mean, for people that don't ask, what do you mean by that? By what? By, by if you did it. No, it's, it's like if, if, it's like trying to, 
every time you're out there, you know, bowl a perfect 300 or, or you know, have Furby every single hole or Michael Jordan shoots 65 points every single night. It just doesn't happen. You have moments that your game and everything lines up because of the work you've done and the night and the audience. Um, but that bar is so high that if you if you compare yourself to what you missed every night, um, <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> so if you compare it, you, you can talk to yourself about what you got that night. Right. And look at what you missed as what the, the exciting more more that you have to do rather than how much you failed. So it took me about thirty years to get to that opinion, but <laughs> it's still shaky. <laughs> But, uh, does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense to me. I mean, I, I know you pretty well. I know, but I'm for the for the audience, the I, think, I, that I think that's great to coach it. Um, what do you think about when you, if I were to say to you, Jimmy, what are you most proud of? Of your work at AQT? Oh, my work at AQT? Yeah. What are you most proud of? Besides your children. That's how I thought you were going to ask me. So. Oh. Um, they're awesome, by the way, the kids. Yeah, they're, they're good kids. I mean, we're biased. But. <laughs> um, I think I'm most proud of the, uh, the people we've gathered over the years, probably. That I don't know if the word is if attrition is right, but it's been a slow gathering of we're like-minded, but we're not alike at all. The different approaches to the work, the different people and personalities. Um, but the people we've gathered have been here and chosen to be here. And the people who this kind of work is not exactly right for them have wound up not coming back. And so slowly we've gathered this group of people that um, are good, really good people. Mm. And uh, I felt for a long time we don't make enough money at this thing. We're not stars. And, and uh, we like to do our work. And we have a good life. We don't want for anything. So I just think um, having the right people in the room that you spend here, because we spend all our time together. Right, right. It's, it's not, not just it's a not, show. It's, it's a different kind of job. And uh, so we spend our social lives together. We spend all day together and do three shows. And, and you socialize in only two, you know, a couple restaurants and you're at the same restaurants. And yeah, there's only, yeah. A couple so, bars. and. Uh, so having the, those good people around all the time, um, they make you better because they're such fine actors and, uh, and we've all grown better at being good people. We've learned how to be a family. It doesn't mean we're perfect all the time and we're not by any means, but um, I guess I would say I'm most proud of the, <clears throat> the community and the culture that APT has fostered here and, uh, and lives by it. A lot of people, it's, it's, it sits in a lot of, you know, bullet points on walls around the country, but to actually do it is very different thing. Do what? Foster kind of culture that I'm talking about. Mm. Uh, uh, both equity and goodness and kindness. And, and everybody says that, but it actually takes real hard work to do that. If you were to talk about a show that you're most proud of, what would what would that show or role or experience be? Oh, I don't know. I hate that question. I know, but I'm asking you. It's like you. asking you, who's your favorite kid? I won't do that, but I will ask so you. So Ken Elmer, ask him what's your favorite rose. My next one. Oh, yeah, that's nice. True. That's nice. That's true. So, no, really, though. I mean, really, this is a moment to think about it. And, like, what comes to mind when you think of the pride you would have in your work and in the roles. And you can't say Romeo because that was, like, 100 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kidding. Oh, I meant to say, we're six feet apart. We're not, though. These are six feet apart, but we're married. So if we look closer, we're not being irresponsible. We're just, we're married. So, yeah. Um, I, I'd probably say Godot and View from the Bridge. Um, <clears throat> I, I love all my, uh, you know, all my classical work I've done, but um, particularly View from the Bridge, I think things, every once in a while you get roles that line up in your life both where you are in your life and your experience and your ability. Um, a lot of the wonderful roles I got to do when I was younger, 
I think I was a little too young at times, and my ability was not up to the role, so I did a fine job. Of, um, but View was one of those shows where I thought it lined up with who I was and the ability I had, the emotional stuff. That's terrifying, that. who you are. That's terrifying. But that's a good, but I think you're right. I mean, I do think you're... Yeah, but yeah. So the first time I, I saw that show, first time I read it, and then I met you, and I was like, someday you're going to play Eddie Come On. I mean, I knew that because of who you, where you were from and how you how you moved through the world. Yeah, so family and everything. There was, there was a lot of stuff that, that lined up with the experiences I had, and then you marry that with your ability and technique at that time in your life, and things just lined up in a great direction and a great cast. <coughs> it was. It was a great show. Um, what do you think you could, if you were given a magic wand, you could do over? It doesn't have to be a show. It could be a situation, or it could be a, be a show. A situation. It could be a situation, or a circumstance, or where you were. I mean, something that you felt like if you could do that again, you would. I'm thinking of roles, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, Richard the Second. I was. I was uh, it's such a difficult play, and, and uh, the language is so difficult. And I, I, again, I think I was fine, but I was not. You know, with what I know now about language and Shakespeare, I wish I could do that. Again. And Winter's Tale, Leontes, I was too young for that. Too. Or maybe not too young age-wise, but too young experience-wise. Hmm. Yeah. I like both those shows. I was a little biased at the time, though, before I had like clearly gotten able to be critical of you in an effective way. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. Just let this one go. That's a joke. This is you joking. This is me smiling. I'm smiling. I'm smiling. That's what he's doing. Just so you, if you, in case you were confused, in case you were confused. Um, how has APT changed you? Not as an actor. Um, well, I, I guess it's made me, particularly when I go away and work other places, I think it's made me, um, I guess just appreciate so much more what goes into making good theater, from the stage managers to the tech crew to management to good people, nice people, actors. Kind of like all of this stuff that I believe goes in, that I believe makes better theater. Um, I think you could have the best actors in the world, the best technicians, and everything, and if they're not good people, I don't think it makes good theater. Really? I, I've seen it. I believe that. That's my belief after over 35 years in the business. I've seen it on stage. It could be flashy and, and perfect and clean, and, but it's something that doesn't hit your heart in my opinion. And the places, and I've been to other theaters which have cultures similar to APT, um, IRT or John Lyons out in Seattle, um, I've been down to the Oslo, and I've seen cultures that foster kindness, and I think they make better art. I think it shows, so, I think it shows in their work. So if we were gonna take that question out of the theater and ask you about personally, how it's changed you, your person, not your awareness, and not about the theater. Like, how has it changed you, Jim, to be a part of ABT? Yeah, well, I, I hope I'm one of those people that's a better person. I, I know in the rehearsal rooms, I'm, well, I'm talking about out of it, but, but even out of that with, with people, and uh, I, I'm much more open than I was before I came to ABT or the first 10 or 15 years of ABT, because it's not easy to change that about yourself. Uh, 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 much more open and, and understanding of the world around me and, um, and that's ongoing I'm just saying I'm better at it and more open than I was and, um, um, and the more people I gather in my life that are better at it than me it shows up when I'm not <laughs> because they are so um, yeah. so you just the kindness you were talking about is kind of permeated you. I hope so. To, you know, I think I'm, so. I'm sure I fail at it at times, but I, I hope so. Yes. Well, you, I think I think that you would know. 
Yeah, well, I get told when I <laughs> when I fail at it. There's a lot of coaches around. <laughs> yeah, I think it's inherently like a trust thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, what did you? What do you wish for APT's future? To be here for a really long time. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers on that. Yep. Um, this is what I really, I do, do really wish that. I, do. I think of all the, like I said, we've been here, what, 27, 8 years now? 27, 26, 27, just about 26 <clears throat> 27 years. Yeah, some of the <clears throat> most rewarding moments have been um, adults, married adults with their kids that have come up to me and they're in their maybe early 30s and then come up to me and say, hey, Mr. DeVita, I saw you when I was in high school. You know, and they're now married with their kids and their kids are not coming. I've seen three generations of kids that have come here when they were 10 and then they've come back in their 20 and then they're married and bring their kids. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Was um, so that's really rewarding. And I think of what a, <coughs> to have something like that in your family that you, this kind of tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and what it's done for our kids in their lives. And like just, you know, my hope is really for that to continue on to the next year when, when you know, when I'm not here as a theater. Um, uh, so I really hope for this to continue in whatever form it takes you know, next. And what do, you, what do you hope that looks like? I have no idea what it's going to look like. The world is changing so much, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know what it looks like. I'd like to spend my last years trying to help with foster and the next generation. We've been doing that a little over the last you know, five, six, seven years where it's I'm talking specifically about people of color, actors of color, the apprentice. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, EDI, of course, and, and um, um, trying to <clears throat> expand our idea of what classic is and inviting stories from other cultures and and um, artists from other cultures. So, um, uh, so we could just have uh, more varied storytelling on our stage. Yep. Um, and so both diverse and younger people out here to do this. Yeah. And to watch it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the idea of like, I think about our mission and I think about like the idea that it's a human being we're after. It's after the experience of being human. And, and for a long time, that human being has been white mm -hmm. and male in a lot of respects, um, as far as the art done. And, but, but if we're after like the idea that, that there is a true universality to some of the stories that we tell, it can only be made greater by the idea of mm -hmm. it being actually universal. Yeah, I agree. Do you remember how to add anything to that? No, I think that sounds really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're all about words at APT, right? And you're a man of few. But very thoughtful words, I would say. I mean, you like words, right? So what's your favorite word? Justice. From the measure for measure, it's about us, justice four times in a row. I just think that's such a... I'm trying to think of Shakespeare when he wrote that. It's, it's so crazy. He's done only two times that I know about. The King Lear, he said, never, 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 four times. And then measure for measure, it's justice. And four is a strange, is an unpredictable number. Um, it's just, it's, I just think it's a brave line to write as a playwright. <clears throat> to give that in an actor's mouth. And, so, and uh, I thought that before the world um, has become what it is today, I've always loved that line. Um, it's all of Shakespeare's plays. I challenge anybody to find a play of his that's not somehow about abuse of power. And... Uh, uh, most of them are specifically about that, but even the ones that you don't think, you'll find some versions of it, whether it's the patriarchy with the father daughters or, or what. Or false staff um, in their lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what little power he has. But, uh, but that word justice, uh, it's, it's not just the justice of how it rings today, but just justice in, in fairness in life. And, I think that's a lot about Shakespeare's poetry, what's not fair. 
And so that's your own in a personal world, world, world. That's one of your favorite words. Yeah. What's your least favorite word? Mucus. <laughs> I think it's a hardly ugly word. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no idea you were going to say that. I thought it was like justice was so very I, I don't like and words that sound ugly. Like moist. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. Some people say that. <laughs> and anything to do with scatological humor, I don't Yeah, know. Jimmy's not a fan of scatological humor. Do you want to tell you those stories? No, no, I don't. Because when he directs the actors, like, now, now they try to do put things like that into my plays because they know I don't like it. So they'd like to test him in rehearsal with choices that are scatological in nature. Um, please tell the one about Cyrano. No, I will not. He will not give it airtime. No, you know, I'll ask that story. It's now. beneath airtime. I asked Marcus. I'll ask Marcus about that. Yes, you ask him too. I'll help. Was it David Daniel as well? No, I think it was Casey. Oh. Ah, Casey Ostra and Marcus. They like scatological humor clearly, and they tested you. Like high school kids. Like high school kids. Yeah, my son, our son, who's not a high school kid, he also likes scatological humor, correct? Mm -hmm. Not his finest attribute in your mind, right? No. no, no. <laughs> He's looking for me to say more on that. I'm not going there. He'll not. Pull a De Niro on you. Oh, that is who you're, that's who you're emulating in this, right? No, I'm actually talking. He, doesn't. he actually doesn't talk at all. Thank you for talking. Thank you for not actually doing that. Um, so here's a good one. Um, if I do say so myself. Um, what advice, what advice, if you could, give your younger self, your child self, what would you say? You can take time to think. Mm -hmm. I know you like to think. I guess just make more mistakes sooner. It, it, it took Ken Alders years of, you're talking about as an artist and theater? I'm saying in life. Oh, in life. Well, you can do both as an actor. Yeah, you can get stuck in as a as any kind of artist and, and trying to do it right. Um, and, and also being concerned with the judgment of others. That's why you try to do it right. So somebody can say, oh, you got it right. And then she got it right. And there, there really is not a right. There's, that sounds airy fairy, but yeah. it's not. There's literally not a right. There's, uh, it's like I don't care how Michael Jordan gets the ball in the in that basket. But you want to get in the basket. You want to get in the basket, but there's not a right way to do it. Right. As long as you did in the basket. Right. That's, there is a wrong way to do it, not get it in the basket. No, but still, the people there are coaches who will look and say, "Well, you got it in the basket. Okay. You could have done it better." So, hey, I got it in the basket. Yeah, there you go. So as long as that, uh, so the basket for us is, you know, good theater, interesting, vivid storytelling, hopefully surprising, hopefully empathetic, hopefully moves people. That's getting it in the basket. Um, so when I was when I was younger, I was much more careful. Um, to Ken Albers beating it out. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. I remember him. He's brutal. Which is great. It's a real, it's a, it's a very common thing to go through as a young too. Well, it has to be working really hard. Yeah, you got to right out of school and you got all the stuff in your head and technique, you know, and then, or like a dancer or a musician, you know, it's playing by the notes and then you play music. Right. You dance by the steps and then you dance. So. so now as a person, as a person, advice you would give your younger self that has nothing to do with acting. Just relax and have more fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want me to go deeper than that? I can see no, your face. Tell me no, more. that's no. We can do it inside. Later. Yeah, I know. You want to continue? The, what did you mean by that? <laughs> what can you say? Love your wife more. <laughs> that's not what I would say later. Yeah, that's say not that. what I would say later. I would not say. I'm sorry that the fly seems to be your friend right now. Oh yeah, yeah. I think so. Fun was not high on my priority list. Yeah, fishing's not that fun. It's the thing oh, you yes choose to do. Yes <laughs> it's the thing you choose to do for fun. Yeah. It's the highlight it's of fun. It's a different kind of fun. I know. It's still kind of work, though. 
patience. No, it's just quiet. It's just quiet. Which doesn't seem like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> to you. It's a lot of fun to me. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say to Danita? No? Thank you for doing this. I know this is like, honestly, I can't, I really try to think of something that you would like to do less than sit on the porch, be videotaped, interviewed by me. Yeah, you got that. Right. <laughs> I think it went pretty well. I think yeah. it went really well. Yeah, you didn't ambush me with anything. So no, are you waiting? This, is there still another? No, there's. This is all the same questions I asked everybody. It's amazing how different everybody is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.